Glory to God. God bless all of you. I appreciate everybody's participation this morning. Uh, Peter, thank you for uh, sharing what the Holy Spirit was speaking to you uh, in terms of laying hands on Eric and praying. I mean, that's the reason we come together. Sometimes things can go by us, but the Holy Spirit's talking, and we respond. We get the blessing and the results of that. Praise God. So praise the Lord. God bless all of you again. Appreciate you being here. Everybody online, God bless you, and thank you for uh, sharing uh, your day with us and the Lord today. Praise God. So thank the Lord again. Amen. It's going to be good. Amen. And I want to talk to you uh, a little bit about the Holy Spirit this morning before we get to that. You know, there's certain things that just rub you the wrong way. You know, I mean, all of us have these little issues. And of course, some of us have more than others. But I hate people who use big words just to make themselves look uh, perspicacious. Amen. Thank you, Peter. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Perspicacious. <laughs> it actually means to be uh, perceptive or have keen judgment or something. Like I was going to say you watch mainstream media. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Praise the Lord. But I, you know, all that aside, I feel pretty proud of myself because uh, that Sesame Street uh, puzzle that I bought said three to five years. I finished it in 18 months. <laughs> Let me ask you this. I, I, I worked in restaurants quite a bit back in, years ago. And if you're waiting for a waiter and you're at a restaurant, aren't you the waiter? <laughs> well. That's why we go to those serve yourself places, I guess. Praise the Lord. Okay, praise God. Um, one more if you can endure it. My neighbor, uh, he really thinks he's smart. He told me, he said, uh, the only food that will make you cry is an onion. So I hit him in the head with a coconut. He wept like a little girl. Praise the Lord. Okay, praise God. God is good. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So I got a couple of things I'd like to share with you this morning. Let's begin with Hebrews chapter 4. Verses 13 through 16. Hebrews 4, verses 13 through 16. Now, I'm going to be brief this morning because I've already set a record this year for how long I can talk, praise the Lord, without saying anything. No, actually, uh, Mike shared with me a couple weeks ago that I had broke my own record. <laughs> praise the Lord. I don't know how long that message was. but It was a pleasant message. Yeah, well, thank you. It was a good message, but it was really long. Amen. We missed the lunch crowd and had to go for the evening meal after church. Praise God. But anyway, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be brief this week, and we'll just ease back into this after having a week off. Praise God. So neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do, seeing then that we have a great high priest. Now get this. This is what we've been talking about this morning. There's nothing of any of us that God doesn't know. Right? right? And so th they're all manifest to him. They're all visible or tangible, right? But all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. But here's the beauty of that. We have a great high priest. Yes. Amen? That is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession of what he has said, not what we do. Not our, not our thoughts, not our feelings but what Jesus has declared us to be. He is forever interceding on our behalf. That doesn't mean he's up there begging. It means that his presence there is a continuous or continual, amen, mediation for our failures, for our weakness, for our flesh. Amen. His presence there declares we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. So for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted to do everything that we do. He just didn't do it. That's what makes him the high priest. That's what makes him, uh, amen, uh, able to intercede on our behalf. So let us, because of that then, let's come boldly to the throne of grace. Don't be humiliated. Don't be condemned. Don't be so... so uh, angry with yourself, so frustrated with yourself that you won't come to God for the grace that he has available to you. Because that's what the devil wants you to do is just get so absorbed 
with your shortcomings or your failures and forget that you have a mediator. You have a high priest that's offering sacrifice, not continual offering, but reminding of the sacrifice he has made. Whereas in the Old Testament, they offered continually. Now there's no need for that. That one sacrifice was sufficient for every screw up we can have. Have had, will have. Amen? So let us therefore, because of this high priest, because that he knows everything and yet he still receives us as the righteousness of God in Christ, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Let's come boldly, amen, for that forgiveness, for that mercy, for that grace, so that we can obtain mercy. You don't get mercy without receiving it. You have to accept it, just like grace. And find grace, and here's the thing, to help in the time of need. We're all going to have times that we're going to need grace. And we've got to be able to come boldly to that place and receive it by faith. Amen? So Mark chapter 2 and verse 22. I mean, if you think about when we reach out to other people, whether it's family members, whether it's strangers, friends, whatever it is. See, if we don't have a, an understanding of the grace that God has for us, I mean, we know us. We know ourselves pretty well, not as well as God does, but we know that we're capable of screwing up and doing just about anything. It's, that is the thing that is supposed to make us or motivate us then to accept other people, wherever they are. Now, their issue may not be my issue, but it's no different as far as God's concerned. It's just an issue. It's just something that is not under the blood the way it should be, right? Not completely dealt with in the natural. In the, in the spirit realm, it's, it's gone. It doesn't exist. But in the natural, we still struggle. So no man puts new wine into old bottles. Now, he, uh, the, the actual translation is new wine into old wineskins. Nobody puts new wine into old wineskins because if they did, the new wine would burst the, the wineskin. And the wine is spilled. And the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put into new bottles or new wineskins. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Our spirit has to be born again in order for that spirit to come and dwell within us. All right? Now, here's what, here's what God's wanting to do. He's wanting to stretch us. Amen? Not, not stretching... Uh, our effort, our human effort, or our creative, you know, ideas or plans, but a stretching of His Spirit in us. Amen? And enlarging, in other words. Praise the Lord. So, Jesus' words about wineskins or bottles describe this same call to stretchability, to be stretched, to get past whatever we've been. Amen? Our natural tendency is to settle for, the, for what is for the status quo, for what we've gotten used to, for what we've accepted, you know, for what we've uh, become comfortable with. Amen? It's to settle for what we have experienced or learned up to this point and think, okay, that's it. That's, this, is, this is what this is all about. The real battle isn't lust. It isn't greed. It isn't conceit. It's not even error. The real battle is the sense that our limits, our boundaries, the, the limits of our understanding are set by God somehow, by his readiness or his willingness to reveal himself to us. In other words, we settle for things that we think is because God's not going to say anymore, he's not going to do anymore, he's not going to reveal anymore. We know what it is. We know what we're to do. We, we just come short, right? But in the parable of the wineskins, Jesus is confronting our comfort zone. He's dealing with, he's not, he's not asking uh, if we think we know everything. He's asking how much are we willing to receive of him, of the newness of the spirit, his spirit. Yeah, we, we got born again and we received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but he's saying, Look, we put new wine into new wineskins, or we put the Holy Spirit into your born-again spirit. Now, how much of that do you want to operate in? Am I making any sense? See, we, we, we know this. We can be totally born again, full of the Holy Spirit, and still function exactly as if we were not saved. Every, we're all capable of it, because we all do it at times, at least 
spots, places, times, yeah. moments, yeah. right? And that's what he's talking about here. He's saying, how much do you want the Holy Spirit to function? Right? And he's saying, it's not up to me because I've given you the fullness of the Spirit. It's up to you. How far do you want to be stretched? How much more do you want? How far do you want to go with this? Are you content with just a ticket to heaven? A get out of hell free card? Praise the Lord. See, here's the deal. New wine isn't just pressed once in a lifetime. I'm talking about the natural now. Jesus is the vine, and we are the people of his vineyard. We are candidates for new outpourings season after season after season. Think, just think of the revelations and the different movements in the body of Christ that have taken place since the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago. Think of the revelations and the, and the manifestations that have taken place. See, God is as prolific in providing fresh spiritual stimulus for us, his body, as agriculture is. Grape harvest every year. Right? We have, to, we have to continue to be ready and to be willing to be stretched to drink new wine. Even if it's processed and the presence of that wine bursts the boundaries of our comfortable Christianity. And I think about some of the things I talk about today and things that I'm learning and I hear shared from other people. And I think back 20 years or 30 years, this would not have been ingestible. It wouldn't have been drinkable 20 years ago. It would have been sour. It would have been not right. It would have been not re I wasn't ready for it, right? And that's, I think, what God is talking about. Every new wave of revelation, every empowerment forces an answer to the question, was the Reformation the end? Or a beginning. Praise the Lord. See, look at John chapter 3, uh, verses 6 through 8. See, they, they, we have no idea what God could and will reveal through us, the church, if we're willing to be stretched beyond what we're used to, what we've experienced, what we have known up to this point. We get paranoid because we, we remember all the things that the religious leaders used to tell us. Hey, don't, don't be going out there and just getting crazy and doing stuff. Without. No, listen, we have the Holy Spirit. If we're not right, he'll bounce us back. He'll bump us back to where we need to be. But as long as we're open to being stretched, he'll keep stretching. He'll keep giving new wine. He'll keep giving us revelation where it comes to grace or where it comes to forgiveness and mercy and all the other things that we didn't, we didn't really understand that well. 25 years ago, 30 years ago, when we thought it was more about how we perform than it was about what he had made available to us, right? So that which is born of the flesh is flesh. It always will be flesh. It's never going to be anything but flesh. So what's born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Amen? Marvel not that I say unto you, you have to be born again. Your, and that's where the, the, the priest that came to Jesus, he, he didn't understand what he was talking about. He said, how can I get born again? He, he's thinking of the flesh. When Jesus is trying to explain to him, your flesh is of the flesh and it will always be of the flesh. It cannot be born again. But the part of you that can be born again must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. And that's your spirit. So the wind blows where it lists or it goes where it wants to go. And you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell it where it came from, or where it's going to. Right? So is everyone that is born in the Spirit. Now, just remember uh, last Monday. You, could, you couldn't see the wind. Now, you could say, oh, man, did you see that wind? No, you didn't see any wind. What you saw were the consequences of that wind. What you saw were the, the effects of the wind. You didn't see the wind. The wind's invisible. But what it impacts makes it visible, makes, makes reality, right? So the wind blows where it will. This is like the Holy Spirit. You can't see the Holy Spirit, but you can see the effects of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. So whether the metaphor is wind 
or whether the metaphor is, is wine, the fact is both of them stretch us. Amen? He's stretching us to make room for these miraculous, mighty manifestations that he's ready to do through us. Yes. Praise the Lord, but he's got to find somebody willing to be stretched. Praise the Lord. That, look, let me, I just heard this the other day. This isn't original with me, but it's still cool and it makes perfect sense to me because it's a question that I've had in my own mind and I suspect some of you may have had it too. But let's look at this in John, um, excuse me, Matthew chapter 10, at verse 1. And then from 1, we'll go to verse 7 through 14. But beginning at Matthew 10, verse 1. When he had called up to him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits. Now, they didn't receive the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit came on them. Right? Because Jesus hadn't been crucified yet. He hadn't been resurrected, so the Holy Spirit hadn't been poured out. But he, the Holy Spirit could still move on people, and that's what Jesus did. He was full of the Holy Spirit. He was the only human being on earth who was filled with the Holy Spirit at that time. He had the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in him bodily. So when he called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits. In other words, he put the Holy Spirit on them to operate as had been the case all throughout the Old Testament with kings and priests and, and uh, different uh, religious leaders. So he gave them power against unclean spirit to cast them out to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. So it's the Holy Spirit that's doing this, right? All right, verse uh, 7 through 14. As you go, now he's talking to these same people, and he says, now I want you to go. You, I uh, put the Holy Spirit on you so that you can go out and do these things. And he says, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, Raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ever receive, freely give, provide neither gold or silver, nor brass in your purses, <coughs> nor strip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor set staves. For the workman is worthy of his meat, and into whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go thence. And when you come into a house, salute it. If the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall say, who shall ever, excuse me, whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Amen? You let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And have you ever wondered, what is that? How does that work? What is that peace that I'm releasing and receiving? Is it just an attitude? Is it, is it, you know, my personality, my nature. No, he's talking about the Holy Spirit here. Okay? Now watch this in Genesis chapter 8, verses 8 through 12. And he's talking about our influence. Our ability to influence other people by the Holy Spirit. Not by our intellect or by our personalities or any of that, but just simply by the Holy Spirit itself. Also, he sent forth a dove. This is talking about Noah. He, they've been on the ark, right? The floods covered the whole earth. Everything's underwater. Everything's dead. Amen. And he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her into, unto himself. And he stayed yet another seven days, the fullness of God, by the way, and seven. And again, he sent forth a dove out of the ark. And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet another seven days and sent forth a dove, which returned not again unto him anymore. So Noah sent the dove, and first the dove came back. Why did the dove come back? Because there wasn't any suitable place for it to land. The same reason Jesus said, when you come into a city, into a home, in contact with another person, you release your peace. In other words, you release the Holy Spirit to them. If the Holy Spirit doesn't find a suitable place to rest, in other words, if that person rejects it or isn't open to the Word of God or to the, to the uh, uh, Holy Spirit, he'll come back. And then you just go on. What did Jesus do? Remember the guy, the rich young ruler? 
And Je he said, what must I do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus said, well, I'll do this, this, and this, because he was answering him the question that the guy was asking him. He wasn't saying just believe. He was telling him to do what the guy was asking to do about, under the law. And he said, I've done all that ever since I was a kid. And Jesus said, well, then go sell everything you have. The Holy Spirit was dealing with this guy because he knew what the guy's problem was, right? And so he said, then sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. The guy's problem was not money. It, his problem was greed. And so Jesus said, give it all away to the poor and then come and follow me. And the, and the guy went away sad. Jesus didn't chase after him and say, oh, I'm sorry. I hurt your feelings. I, I didn't mean to, to be cruel. I, I was No, he released the dove. The dove couldn't find a place to rest. So he came back. He released the Holy Spirit to minister to the man, but the man didn't want the Holy Spirit. He wanted religion. He wanted a five-step program. He wanted something other than that. And so the Spirit came back, and Jesus just walked on. He did what he told his disciples to do. He basically shook, shook the dust off of him and moved on to the next place. Amen? That's how we're to deal with people. Not cruelly, not viciously, not mean, but we release the Holy Spirit. We release the love of God. And if it finds a place to rest, in other words, if that person's hungry, if that person's somebody that God's dealing with, they'll receive it. If they don't, the Holy Spirit comes back and we move on to the next one. That person will get another op opportunity after opportunity. It may just not be you that gets to release it the next time, right? So think about it. Dove, a dove is the international symbol of peace. That's, that's the metaphor that he's using here. Peace in one place, the Holy Spirit in another. A dove, that's all the same. These are all the same realities, but he's just using a different metaphor for each one. So look at Mark then, with that in mind. Look at Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. So Jesus comes to John the Baptist, who's at the Jordan River. And what does he do? He comes down in those days of Jesus from Nazareth, Galilee, was baptized in John in the Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open in spirit like a dove. Again, that's the metaphor we're talking about. That goes all the way back to Noah, and it's all the way up to the peace that he's talking about. These are just different words for the same thing. Spirit like a dove descending upon him, and there came a voice from heaven saying, Now art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Praise the Lord. So the Holy Ghost is like a dove. The Holy Spirit is like a dove, right? All right, look at now John chapter 14, verses 26 and 27. The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things into your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The Comforter is going to come from me. The Father is going to send it. It's coming from me. It's, my, it's his spirit, right? And he, he has said it in my name and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. He just told us it was the Holy Spirit who was going to leave with us, right? It's a dove. It's peace, Right? My peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, but I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace, my peace, my spirit I leave with you. Not like the world gives peace. Amen? Look, one of the reasons we can be positive about negative situations is we have the Holy Spirit. We have the peace of God. We have the Spirit of God to encourage us, to, to lead us, and to guide us into all truth. Amen? Not, not, the, not the facts, but the truth. Facts change all the time. The truth never changes. It's the same forever. Amen? So, let, let, me, let me go back to this. The, the Holy Spirit, the grace of God. I think it's interesting. I don't want to start a new theology here, but I do, I do think it's interesting that the Holy Spirit never entered into anybody under the Old Covenant. It would come on them momentarily, temporarily, for a purpose, and then it would depart. It would go away, right? Why? Well, because it wasn't suitable. The, the ground wasn't suitable for that dove to land on. It could hover. It could be there, but it wouldn't stay. It would only be there long enough for God to accomplish what it was he was trying to accomplish through that individual, and the Holy Spirit would leave. All right? So grace came by Jesus Christ, and so did the permanence of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because without grace, it couldn't stay. Without grace, we would be uninhabitable for God. Am I making some sense this morning? Praise the Lord. So he's trying to get us to understand it's 
He has made us acceptable. He has made us a landing spot. He has made us a dwelling place for God, the Holy Spirit. That dove came back that last time before he stayed. He came back with a fig leaf. <laughs> it's just fascinating to me. What did Adam and Eve start off with? As soon as they stepped out away from God, it was fig leaves that they were sowing to cover themselves with. It's like the dove, come, the Holy Spirit come back and said, these won't be necessary. I'm going to stay this time. And it's the way it is for us. We don't have to cover our weakness, our failures, our humanity. It's covered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has made us acceptable in whatever condition we're in. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So God pours out to mankind. He, 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 he pours to us and he flows through the vessels who are already his. Um, right? He, God moves through us. He has to flow out of us. Wine is another metaphor for the Holy Spirit. So is the wind. But the, the wine has to flow out of us. We are the wineskins holding, we are the new wineskins holding the new wine for whoever else is thirsty, right, that wants to drink. We have to be stretched. If we're going to operate under our old self, the new wine bursts the vessel. Yeah. Yeah. But if we're operating in agreement with God, that new wine is in a new wineskin. And it's pliable, it's stretchable, it's expandable. It's able to become bigger, to hold more, to release more, right? So God's greatest workings are, they're waiting on us. Every, every move of God has been a result of somebody saying, here am I, use me. Yes. Or I'll take a risk and say, the just shall live by faith. Even if it's contrary to everything religion is telling us today. Even if it means there'll be persecutions. Even if it means there'll be executions. But God's trying to open up something. He's trying to release more. He's trying to pour out more wine. And he needs vessels, amen, that are expandable, stretchable. We're waiting on God, and God's waiting on us to be stretched to the dimension of his grace and his power. So we, I don't, I mean, we can't hardly expect to reproduce mightily unless we're willing to be stretched mightily. It's like a woman who's pregnant. Now, I've never been pregnant, <laughs> but I've been around women that I have. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And that process isn't comfortable. My daughter has, our youngest daughter has five kids. And I know she's had issues. In fact, this is a testimony for the Lord. She had blood clots with the last two. Dangerous. I mean, you could end up having a heart attack. You could end up losing a leg or an arm, wherever that blood clot is. The other day, in fact, it was Monday, she brought the kids over and dropped them off because she was sure she had a blood clot. She knows what they are. She's had them before, and she knows what the, you know, kind of the, symptoms and everything are. So Tammy and Allison went to the emergency room because you can't go to the doctors anymore, you know. So she goes down there because of the blood clot. And uh, we had the kids and that was when the storm, the kids were at our place. I was in Altoona and uh, anyway, that's all beside the point. The bottom line is she got down there, sat down there for three or four hours at least, sure that she had one. A fella came into the hospital carrying his young son, a black gentleman, by the way, and he was speaking in tongues. Yeah. They, I, thought he was just they thought he was just screaming at first until they saw he was carrying this little boy, and he was speaking in tongues, and they recognized it immediately, and they both started speaking in tongues because the boy was dead, or they thought he was dead. That man kept praying in tongues, kept speaking in tongues. They finally, they, Allison and, and Tammy both said they were just, they were speaking in tongues, 
not because they wanted to, just to help him out. They couldn't help themselves. This power of God was so powerful, the spirit of God was so strong that they were just caught up in it. Allison said, you know, she forgot all about her blood clot. She's crying, they're weeping there with this my man. Well, it turns out the boy didn't die or he came back to life, whatever, whichever way it was, he lived, he survived. They saw the man later in the day and uh, after, you know, after an hour or two later and the boy lived. Allison finally gets in to see the doctor and they said, well, you don't have any blood clots. We can't see that you've ever had any blood clots. I'm telling you, it was the Holy Ghost. That's right. He's not a respecter of person. This man was praying for his boy. God heard him and God responded. But they were there in the proximity and they're praying in tongues too and who knows what they were praying. But God is no respecter of persons. You get there, you get close to the Holy Spirit, you're going to get some benefit. This man was calling down God for his son and they got some overflow. That's what I'm telling you, I believe that in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We don't recognize the power of the Holy Spirit. We might be tempted to be a little reserved. This guy had a boy that was dying yeah. or was already dead. He wasn't concerned about proprieties. Yeah. This is my son, and I'm not giving him up. I'm not going to just let go. And thank God he didn't, because not only did he get his son resurrected, he got my daughter healed of blood clots. I think we ought to give the Lord a hand. So I'm saying we can't expect to be used mightily if we're not willing to be stretched mightily. If we're, if we're afraid, amen, of what somebody will think or say, we're not going to be of much value to God or to that person who needs us desperately. This guy didn't have to know that my daughter needed to be healed of blood clots. All he needed to do was be submitted to the Holy Spirit for his purpose and let the Holy Spirit do what he does. Praise God. Isaiah 66, verses 7 through 9. And I believe this is where God's got us today. What all this stuff is about. It isn't God, but God will use it. And he'll use it for his glory. He'll use it to slap the devil right in the face with his own game, with his own tricks. Praise the Lord. Before she travailed, she brought forth, before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth? Saith the Lord, shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb? Saith God. In other words, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. Did I give you the Holy Spirit for nothing? No, I gave you the Holy Spirit to birth other people. For other people to be born again. Right? So I, I didn't give it to you and then shut up the womb. Because if you'll be stretched before you give birth. Before you have those uh, final pains. The final stretching. The child will come forth. The person will get born again. The individual, the, the, the people you're interacting with, the contacts that you're making. Praise the Lord. And Jesus, because look, Jesus spoke about the church too. The age of the church as being like a woman in labor. Convulsions he talked about. That the church age, the final church age would be similar to that or like that. Amen. Born of the Spirit. You must be born again. Peace that passes understanding. So what I'm talking about isn't just a hunger. It isn't just a, a waiting or a wanting some different or new spiritual excitement. But it's the fullness of God that he's talking about. That Jesus walked in and he said we have access to. That is the Holy Spirit being filled with the Holy Spirit or expanding the vessel to hold a greater degree of God or to have a greater release of God from their life. Romans 11.33 Oh, the 
depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. That, one, that scripture always bothered me, that one in, and in Isaiah where he says, his ways are not our ways, his ways are above our ways. We, how are we can understand any of that? I was talking to people who are not believers. He gave us his word. He said, I'm going to put my word in your heart and in your mouth. He said, you have the mind of Christ. Put on the mind of Christ. So it isn't that we don't have access to it. it isn't, it's just that we don't always operate in it. That's right. So that's not meant. Those scriptures are not meant to stifle our hunger or, or promote a, a passive attitude or to set limits on God using us simply because, well, how can I know what God's wanting to do? And I'm not, I don't have the mind of God. And he's, his ways are far above mine. And it's using that as an excuse for him not revealing more to us. And that's not what he's talking about. If we're born again, we have a promise from God that to be filled with the fullness of God, just as Jesus was. Matthew 5 and verse 6. He wants to reveal more to us, but we have to want to have more revealed to us. Blessed are they who do hunger, which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. God is the only righteous. His righteousness becomes our righteousness when we're born again. So when we're hungering, when we're thirsting after that reality, after that truth, that's when we get filled. Am I making sense? When we really get to the place where we're hungering after God's promise for me, which is I am the righteousness of God. I don't care what I think about myself. When I'm hungering after that, when I'm going to believe what God said in spite of what I'm seeing in the mirror, in spite of what I'm experiencing in my own behavior, if I can stay focused on what God has said, that can be mine. Yes, but the condition depends on me, not on God. He's made it out there. He's, put, he's made it available. The question is, do I want it enough to stay focused on it? God wants to reveal his fullness to everybody who believes in him, who seeks him. Amen? Luke 16, 16. And I think this is the problem, or at least it's simply it is a problem for me. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it or stretches himself to get in there. You know how mice do? You ever, have, you ever get a mouse in your house? We haven't, not in the house we live in now, but we have in other places we've lived. And they can get in. I mean, a mouse this big can get through a crack that's like this. They stretch themselves. They press themselves into stuff. If they want, they can, they're, they're weird. They're just a weird animal. But they can shrink themselves down somehow, make themselves almost flat and wiggle their way in through uh, a drain, kitchen sink. We had one one time in Texas, and that's how it got in, through, uh, through, the, through the drain in the kitchen. Granted, it was Texas, and they don't have basements, and so, praise the Lord, they have a little access maybe that they wouldn't have otherwise. But I'm just saying, that's, what, that's the, the terminology he's using here, to, to, to stretch ourselves, to, to press ourselves in to this thing. So we ever, here's the deal. For me personally, and I think it's, it's true with a lot of people, We've got a problem with the idea that God has left so much up to us. We just want to, you know, we're, we're like the leper. You know, uh, he comes to the prophet and he says, you know, I've got leprosy. My servant told me that uh, you, you can heal me. And he said, go down and dip in the water seven times. What? I, th I thought you'd just say something and wave your hand over me and, and I'd be healed. I mean, after all, why do I have to do something? He was stretching him. See what I'm saying? He wasn't going to heal himself by dipping in the water seven times, but he was stretching him to believe what God asked of him. And that's where we find ourselves a lot of times. It's like, you know, are you leaving this up to me with my record? I mean, I'm like the leper. leper leprosy is a type of sin. And that's the way we, in our minds, we think, oh, surely, God, you're, you're going to have to find some big name for this, or you're going to have to do this. I can't do it. I'm, you know me. So we've got trouble and problems trying to believe that God wants to use us, that he wants to, the kingdom breakthrough is depending on 
us stretching or us pressing into what God has promised. And religion hasn't helped because all we've seen, and even to today, you turn on Christian TV and it's some big name. If you could just get Brother So-and-so to come and pray for you, if you could just get to this revival, or if you could just get to that meeting. I'm not against any of that. I'm just saying that's not where God intended it to be. He intended every one of us to lay hands on the sick, for every one of us to be stretched, for every one of us to be filled to the fullness of God so that we could appropriate the promises of God, not just for ourselves, but for the people that we come into contact with. That's how the church grows. That's how Jesus built this whole thing. Amen. And that's how he, he's not going to change. He's not going to change his plan. We've got to get some revelation. We've got to be stretched a little bit to believe that we could do some things that we haven't done. Yes. That we can do everything Jesus did and then some. Yes. Because that's what he told us. Amen. Greater works than these will you do. Why? Because I'm going to stretch you. I'm going to use what the enemy meant for evil to stretch you so that you can function the way only a child of God can function. My younger son has a, a wedding bar, and uh, Saturday there was to be a wedding of 150 people who were supposed to be there, which is half of their capacity. The, janitor, the electricity was back on at the time when everybody started arriving, but the electricity went off. They got a generator, and the generators wouldn't work, and they tried everything. They had four electric trucks out there trying to get the electric going for, for this wedding. And Dwayne said, well, we've done everything else we can do. And he reached over and he laid his hand on the generator. And he said, in Jesus' name, and that generator came yep. on just like that. And all the people in that wedding saw. So it was for those people. Yeah. And my son was just blown away that it came on. Mm -hmm. But it did. Yeah. That's the way we're to operate. That's the way the Holy Spirit wants yeah. to function. Yeah. Through us. Praise God. Think about it. God, His, is all the kingdom and the power and the glory, and yet He restricts Himself to the hunger and to the passion of His people. It's amazing. All the power, the glory, everything that is, is in Him, and yet He holds Himself back. It's like Jesus. He, he could have if he wanted to, if at any time he could. See, you know, he said, Father, if it's possible, have this cup passed. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. At any time, he could have got so aggravated, so frustrated, that he could have just thrown off the physical. He was God. He was every bit God. He just wouldn't function as God. He functioned as a man filled with the Godhead. Praise God. He restricts himself to us. And the truth is, that is the whole redemptive process from beginning to end. He, he holds back so that we'll step forward. Galatians 4, verses 1 through 7. Now I say that the heir, that's us, as long as he's a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. And that's us. We have the fullness of the Godhead in us bodily. But we still function, for the most part, like servants, like religious. So, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed to the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons... God has sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. How I many of you know that if you're a son, and I'm talking about in the spiritual realm, you're not judged. Okay, so your father's the king. And you act up one day. It's not good. It's not a good example. But if the servant does the same thing that you did, he's in serious trouble. The, the servant's going to be punished. The servant is going to experience some retribution. The son won't. The worst that will happen to the son is 
Don't do that anymore. It's not good. Makes you look bad. Gives me a bad name. Right? But the servant, that's so he, therefore, you're no more a servant. You're not, tr- you're not going to be judged like a servant. You're not going to be corrected like a servant. You're not going to be punished the way a servant is. You're going to be treated like a son. Embraced. Loved. An heir of God. He's not going to destroy his heir. That's, his, that's how he lives on forever. Right? I'm talking about in the natural. But that's how God is revealed in the earth as well. So verse 19. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. This is Paul talking about. This goes back to what I was talking about. The Holy Spirit moving. And it's, sometimes it's like a, a woman in childbirth. He said, I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. In other words, what he's saying is, I'm releasing my confidence in the Holy Spirit to see you born again as I have been born again. That you're going to get the same benefit that I got from that spirit. A born again experience. A life changing experience. So he commissions the power for its fulfillment. I mean, it's not just for nothing. He commissions the power for its fulfillment. And we have to have revelation for fullness in order to complete the manifestation. Let me say it again. So. He commissions the power. All power is given unto you. Right? Jesus said, all power is given unto me. Go ye therefore, because now you're in me, you have that same power, right? So he commissions the power for its fulfillment. For the power to be fulfilled, right? But we need a revelation of our fullness or the fullness of the Godhead in us so that we can complete the manifestation because we have to be the ones who manifest this. Because God's not coming down here independent of us. Praise the Lord. So if we are the impetus, amen, for a new dynamic manifestation, amen, of the church, then it's going to require some stretching. Stretching our expectations. Stretching our, our, con- our, our understanding. What we've been used to. What we've settled for. In order for us to contain more of the fullness of God's spirit and power. On the one hand, we are filled with the fullness of God. But unless that manifests, it's, you know, like having money in the bank and not ever writing a check. Or making a withdrawal and wondering why, you know, you don't have anything. Ephesians 4, uh, verses 13 through 16. Till we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children. Amen. Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Praise God. Verse 18. No, excuse me. What's, let, me, let me ask this question. What's the unity of faith that we're called to? Is it just you and I agree? No, it's the fullness of Christ. It's to us to be Jesus in the earth. We, we're, I, I mean, it's kind of tongue ties you a little bit thinking to say it, but it's the truth. We have to see ourselves as the Jesus in this earth. And I know it's a contradiction because our physical man doesn't reflect that. But that's why we need to have the fullness of the spirit so that we can function from the spirit and not from the flesh. Ephesians 3.19 And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with the fullness of God. Praise the Lord. The definition of fullness isn't superiority. It's It's not even maturity. It's stretchability. 
It's the ability to be stretched by God. The willingness to be stretched. It means we've allowed the Holy Spirit to renew the wineskins of our spirit. To expand the vision. To expand our understanding. To enlarge our heart for the lost or, that are around us. For the people that are struggling among us. For ourselves. Joel 3, 13 and 14. Put you in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Verse 18. And it will come to pass in that day, the day he just spoke of, the day that I believe we're living in right now, that the mountains will drop down new wine. The hills shall flow with milk, and the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters. A fountain shall come forth out of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. That harvest is by people who the Holy Spirit has outpoured to them at a measure of fullness that has never been known by any previous generation. It has to be true. Otherwise, we could not continue the book of Acts. We could not do more than what Jesus did. I believe that's the generation we're in. I believe that's the people that we are. And I believe that's why the enemy knows his time is short, and he's throwing everything he can throw at us to get people to give up, to get people to get depressed, to get people isolated and, and, and not trust anymore. And you've got the media and even a lot of religious people. That's the judgments of God because of this or that. Baloney. The judgments of God took place on Jesus 2,000 years yes. ago. There'll be no more judgment until we're out of here. That's right. Until everyone who has believed in him has been taken. Yes. Praise the Lord. We are a privileged generation. We are the children. In my mind, and I believe in my heart, we are the children who were like servants for 2,000 years. Working, 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 trying to get approval from the, from the master. But we're the generation that wakes up to the fact that we are no longer children or servants, but heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That is what will make the difference in the last day. That is what will stop the lies of the enemy. It'll be a measure of fullness. A measure that has been received by people too thirsty for God to care that the taste of the new wine is never quite as mellow as the old or as comfortable. You're not as used to it. It's got a different taste. It's got a little different twang. It's got a little, I'm not a big wine drinker, but I'm telling you, there's lots of different wines. And that's, that's what I think he's telling us, is that this, this fullness that he's giving us, it won't necessarily look like what just came before us. It won't taste just like the religious things we've seen in the past. It'll be different. It'll be new wine, but it'll still be from God. And it will, per it will serve the purpose that God intended for it. But we've got to be willing to drink it. We've got to be willing to receive it. We've got to be willing to then share it with anybody else. Amen? It's fresh. It's new. It's, it's, it's new wine. We haven't tasted it before. Haven't experienced it before. We kind of know something about wine. We've had the Holy Spirit, right? But this is new wine. This is wine that will kind of cause you to look back at the old wine and say, wow, this is a little different. This has got a different thing going on here. I'm, I've got a buzz going I never had with that other. You know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to be, you know. Yes, I am being based, but that's beside the point. But here's the deal. With the taste, and I'm quitting. With the taste of new wine on our tongue and empowered by grace, I think what God is saying is, Let's go get the harvest of the latter rain. Yes. Come with me. Yes. All you that are labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. The Holy Spirit will go before you and accomplish what we could never do on our own or through religion. 
It's the God's ladder rain. I'm thinking, when I was a kid, and I even see it with the grandkids today, I, there was nothing I liked better than going out and playing in the rain. Running through the mud puddles, just getting soaking wet. Now our parents, as long as there wasn't lightning strikes nearby, <laughs> they'd say, go ahead, have fun. Just take your shoes and your pants off at the back door. Don't come tracking through the house. You know what I'm saying? But that's, I, I th that's what I feel like. We're, we're like little kids playing in the rain, thirsting for new wine, for the fullness of God. Peace that passes understanding. A fresh wind that blows all the old away and leaves the fresh air and the new wine. In Jesus' name. There's, just like with natural grapes, there are multiple harvests. There's potential for new wine every year. Amen? Sometimes in some, in some places, twice a year, depending on the seasons and, and the grapes that they grow. So it's not, it's not a one-time thing. It was poured out 2,000 years ago. No, God wants to keep pouring it out. He wants there to be new wine for every generation. One generation will be willing to stretch themselves for the wine that, only the wine that can change everything. So the Holy Spirit is so magnified and so intense that he's touching people everywhere. Just like the, the gentleman that come into the hospital with his son. He didn't know what he was doing, I don't think, other than he knew he didn't want to give up his son. And he released the Holy Spirit. The young man was saved, and my daughter was healed of blood clots. A bystander, basically, that just got caught up in the flow of wine. Stretched. That man... That man stretched the wine skin so that more could flow, not just for his son, but for everybody that was around him. That's what God wants to do with us. We don't have to understand it all. We just have to be willing to be stretched. We just have to be willing to take a step of faith and watch what God will do. We are the children of the generation that will see this come to pass. I believe that with all my heart. And if that's the case, something dramatically different has to take place. And I believe it's simply the empowering of the Holy Spirit with the people that have been so fed up with everything they put up with, they're willing to be stretched out to try something different. Let's try a new wine. Amen? I don't need a vintage that's 2,000 years old. I'll, I'll drink what was plucked yesterday. I'll, I'll drink what was poured out this morning. Praise the Lord. And it'll be to my benefit and everybody around me. In Jesus' name. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise Let's the Lord. give the Lord a hand and clap today. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So, yeah, we're living in tremendous times. And, of course, because they are, the pressure is greater, right? But because the pressure is greater, we rise to a higher level. Amen? Whatever the enemy meant for evil, God will make for good. Amen? No weapon formed against us can prosper. Every tongue that rises in judgment against us, we condemn. Let's do it. Let's go, let's go get stretched today. Let's get some new wine flowing. Amen. And see the impact that it can have on our world, our families, and our loved ones, and everybody around us. In Jesus' name. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.